This is Larry Culpepper. I love college football so much that I, I went ahead and came up with the idea of the playoff for it. And the only way I can get ready for each and every Saturday of college football is by listening to the Championship Drive podcast. Wow, look at that. as a mountain on it. I don't know why there's a mountain on there. From North Carolina going round and around the music city cranking out the country sounds that both come together extravagantly on the red nigger rodeo every Tuesday we'll we'll Elliot side the say to the four six today tune in and find out Sound like Santa Claus? <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. Yee-ha! Hey, everybody. Hey, he's Marty and I'm McGee. And uh, you know who I'm happy for that we've done a couple podcasts now? Who? Uh, Billy Higgins, because now he can chill out. Yeah, my man's been on us like a stink on a June bug. And <laughs> he's wanted us to, he's just really wanted to, he's wanted to hear his own song. And there you go. We just played it. We love you, Billy. What would we be without, without Billy? Good. I don't know. You'd be a man with a furniture row racing coffee right. mug with a mountain on it. We were just out in the hallway. We were stuck, right? So you, you guys were in traffic, and I was in traffic, and we got to the ESPN 730, and those guys were stuck in traffic. So we were standing out in the hallway talking about the media tour and how boring it was. Pretty boring. Because it was, it was boring. And, uh, but I got this mug. I got this coffee mug from Furniture Row. Did you bring that from home? Yeah. This I is c- bad coffee. I made coffee this morning. I give you credit that, that for was, keeping that. I that bet was not my best. Effort. I bet uh, Barney Visser and Martin Truex appreciate that. There you go. Why don't you say hello? Hi. Lanester's in the house today. Lanester's in the house. How was the birthday? Uh, bir- birthday extravaganza was fantastic. Pull your microphone. American over. Sniper. We saw some. <laughs> we, did, we did not go see American Sniper. I bailed out on that, but we'll do that on another romantic day. We had that discussion point. on the podcast. I heard it. I, su- I tuned in. I suggested SpongeBob over. Listen, you don't understand. Uh, as much as we heard back on social media from the 406 about where in the world we'd been over the last two months, right? This one over here was the leading the charge yeah. on making sure we got back in the studio and and recorded a 406 podcast. I mean, adamant that we keep it real on the 406. That's true. That was a Lanester's got some persistence about her. Andy Katz, I did. I was the Paul Feinbaum show yesterday, and Andy Katz was on the show. And did Kat, he say? Huh? Kat, Katz walked straight in the door and he sat down and he goes, "I need you to explain the 406." Really? He goes, is that an area code? Is that? I said, no. I explained it to him right on the show. And what did he say? He, he was he was like, oh, okay. Like everybody's reaction is like, oh, okay. Like they they think it's some it's like not the Montana. Code. They think it's some deep meaning, and it's not. It's just that's our. People. You sound like LeBron James uh, tw- uh, 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 responding to his tweets about his teammates. Yeah. This is yeah. Huh. Huh. So we have a big show here for you guys today. Uh, Danica Patrick is going to join the 406 for the first time ever. Her plane is her plane is a bit landing tardy. now in Connecticut. Actually, you know who just walked in the studio? Whoa, what, what, a, what a segue, Dodd. You know, that's what I do here. God, I mean, you don't make enough money, Dodd. When you can just snap <laughs> your fingers and the interview subject appears. Danica Patrick, no less. I, I just, I don't know how you do it, Dodd. Are you one of the Lord of the Rings? <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to go there, but... He got a ring. So, I mean, yeah. when Charles Barkley tells you to shave your face, it's true. You're, and then you snap your fingers and Danica Patrick appears. You're a Lord of the Ring. I don't think you can argue with that. I think that's pretty. You're pretty Lord across the board. You're Lord Dodd. <laughs> so let's talk to Danica now while we have her. <laughs> okay. Hi, Danica. Hi. Well, get her a microphone, Dodd. She I'm sounds trying, like she's in the I'm closet. Trying. There, there you go. go. He was pushing a bunch of buttons over there, but apparently none you see to activate what we, my mic. You see what we have to deal with, Danica? Maybe a, he's really not a magician from that, Lord of the Rings. Very true. That didn't take very long. Yeah. But he Dan- does have the beard for it. Uh, in his beard. <laughs> Danica, I want you to describe his beard for us, because we have not seen him in a while. He got, Now, Danica, just so well, you have... Well, his hair is very soft and silky and smooth on the top, but he has a gnarly beard. Wow. Yeah, wow. It's very thick and curly. So he's Julian Edelman, Lord of the Dodd. 
<laughs> I might be judged for this, but I have never seen any of the Lord of the Rings movies. But uh, okay. well, but uh, sure. Guess who else hasn't? Me. Well, just a Laney's qu- here, Danica, my wife, and she has not seen them either. So yeah. that's three. That's seventy. Wait, Dodd, have you seen them? Yeah. Uh, well, here's the thing, though. I only watched the extended editions. Cause okay. Cause, hey, qu- quick synopsis: There's a bunch of. It's like a bunch of freaks and they're walking through the woods and then a bunch of monsters show up and they fight and then they talk and then they fight again and then they talk and then at the end they get the ring what's that go. one guy's name like hoblum or yeah, something like know. that that's fine that, that really seriously that's it there's like six movies and i just summed up all of them there's a i dragon. feel like it's one of those movies that would scare me now like kind of like did you guys ever see labyrinth when you were a kid oh yeah right i watched it when i was a kid thought it was the best movie ever that and um wizard of oz and now i see them as an adult and i'm like they kind of scare the heck out of me and I feel like that might be Lord of the Rings. Like it's really cool when it's really cool, but I think it would scare me now. The most terrifying movie I saw as a youth was Cujo. Because Why did you watch Cujo? I don't know. So you met my dog on occasion. <laughs> that, but the thing about the Cujo is that guy's in that car yeah. and he's like terrified of this dog and that dog's just slobbering everywhere and all ticked off at the world. This is, for me it was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. My daughter's ten and we watched that and there's like ten minutes in the middle of that movie that are like a horror movie. And I'm like, Really? Like, I've I never seen it. But Will we have it in it I think we have it in our yeah. uh Rocket ship minivan. Right, I got to be honest. When they said you'd have Danica Patrick on, I didn't think we'd be going Labyrinth, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Dodd's Beard. I told you, Lord of the Dodd. He go. does these things. Danica, how you doing? I'm good. Sorry, I'm a little late. I, I don't. We weren't really late flying in. I think at the airport's just forever away here. We were in it, the car for like 35 minutes. Yeah, it we, is forever away, right. and they only have six or eight feet of snow up there, I think. I did. There is snow here, most definitely. But the roads are clear, and there was no traffic. So I'm sorry. I kept you waiting. No, you, 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 we were running late, too. So you probably good. have better conversation without me. <laughs> well, I think that's a negative because we're just not that interesting. <laughs> well, well, so there's no snow in Daytona. Are you ready? I mean, it, it seems like for, I'm the first person to say that I've always felt like the NASCAR offseason is too short. This year... Yeah, you're crazy. I'm not saying that. No, this year I'm ready to go. I, it's just there's nothing. Nothing. Oh, happening. it's yeah. you. Th- I thought you said you think that the NASCAR off seasons are too. Sh- okay, yes, they are too yeah. short. Yes, sir. Yeah, in the uh, year, yeah, years past. Oh no, it, they're it, entirely it, too short. But oddly enough, I actually am with you this year. I'm. I'm not. I don't get excited necessarily or anxious or re- you know anything like that because I know that it's going to be nine solid months of of like going, going, going. But um, I'm I'm ready to go. I'm kind of bored. So, are, well, I don't know. We've sort of been a little busy, I guess. I'm yeah. ready to go racing, though. I'm ready to get down there. So I always wonder this question of racers, and I've never asked this particular question of you. What race changed your life? Yeah, uh, Indy 500. How did it change your life? People knew how to pronounce my name. <laughs> how did they pronounce it before the Indy Actually, 500? Actually, I just met a girl in the airport who has the name Danica, and she appreciates that uh, – it's a well-known name because it helps people be able to pronounce her name right. So what did they say? Danica? Danaka, Danica, Dancia. Oh, Dancia. Dancia is nice. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> the name is phonetic. I can't I don't understand why people can't pronounce it right, but Danica sounded out. But anyway, it's uh it's um what were we talking about? Names? How the Indy 500 changed your life. <laughs> uh, you know, it it's um uh, it just uh, it put me on the map, you know. Honestly, it was just really about visibility, and it was a big storyline, and um, it it kind of broke through. Um, it broke through sports media into mainstream media, which was a big big thing. And so, uh, yeah, it's uh, it was it was that one, and then and then the Indy Five Hundreds to follow up, and I was fortunate enough that every year I was in a position to to either win or finish really well. I, I would have been finished in the top 10 every year if I wouldn't have been taken out on pit road when I was in like sixth place or something like that with the last coming out of the pits for the last pit stop. So, um, you know, I had a good track record there. So, and that was always our biggest race. And then, um, and then, you know, coming to NASCAR in and of itself was a big deal. And then, um, you know, qualifying for the Daytona 500 pole, um, two years ago was, uh, was another big deal. They can, they say that the the media from that is like winning the fourth biggest race, which it's not a race, but <laughs> um, so you know things like that. Um, I've been really really fortunate in my career to have good days on big days. 
I, I've never seen anything like the. I mean, this will be my twentieth Speed Weeks of Daytona. We we're talking about this today, this morning before we started the show. I've never seen anything like the crush that followed you those first two years. The ARCA race was the like ARCA a, race. That's a, what I think about. Beatles. I've never seen anything like it. And, and it, but now that you've gotten some years under your belt, and I know you haven't performed like you wanted to, but but is it? Easier to go down now, and it kind of feels like, all right, I'm going to work as opposed to – I mean, you're always going to have the following. And, and if you have success, obviously that following is going to return. But is it nice to kind of settle into, all right, this is well, work now as opposed to what we saw it in doesn't, particular the first couple of years? No, it doesn't really matter to me either way. I mean, I, I mean I'm, it doesn't bother me. It, it, um, I'm honored to have it. I – I don't feel like it distracts me. Um, it's so it is what it is, and and usually it represents good things. So you know when things go well too, that that kind of happens again. But um, it uh, it always, it seems to be the same no matter what I do. If it's a new place, it seems to be. Uh, so I'm somewhat of a zoo animal, and people look. But <laughs> um, no matter whether I go to like a dirt race with Ricky and nobody's seen me before and people are kind of staring and huddling around or whether it's being in NASCAR for the first time or IndyCar, whatever it may be, it's like a new environment is what kind of draws that in. But then once I'm there for a while, people get used to it and they, um, you know, they've, they've, they've looked. Do they just stare? <laughs> do they just stare at you and point and go? Pss, pss, Man, pss, I, I got to tell you, I, I I don't really have a lot of tolerance for staring and pointing. I usually look at them and say, "Can I help you?" <laughs> I'm sorry, you're staring. I'm sorry, you're pointing. Can I help you with something? They might be lick, They might be looking at, at Ricky's mullet. It's a vicious mullet right that now. Thing is it's like getting frizzy. Eighth, it's an eighth wonder of the world. It's kind of like your beard. My it's beard's like, awesome. It's getting like that. My beard is pretty gnarly. I did have to shave. I didn't have to shave it, but I did shave it, and now it's coming back. Though it's a nice sort of, it's a nice compromise. I wasn't now. talking about your beard. Oh, what beard? Oh, you're about talking about Dodd's beard. Oh, it's her new friend. This got awkward. Sorry about that, Marty. <laughs> Funny. Well, when we go to Daytona, yeah, you you've had success there. Obviously, you've had chances to win that race, the Daytona 500. What is it about you that racetrack drafting that style of racing? What is it that that you were able to kind of walk into that? It seems like more comfortable than other types of racetracks. For me, it was very similar to uh, IndyCar racing the way it was for a long time, which was a lot of oval racing, a lot of mile and a half racetracks, and. Mile and a half style racing in IndyCar is like two and a half mile racing in 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 NASCAR. Um, it, generally, I mean, you can run a lot closer in NASCAR than you could in, can in IndyCar, but um, but for the most part, it's pretty similar. It's like a high speed chess match. You're just doing everything you can to make sure that you don't have to lift, and then you move forward and about picking the right line and uh, good pit stops and things like that. They're um, they're really important, um, and being with a good team, I think that also is really important with uh, with uh, those kinds of races where it's just flat out and speed, and you need good cars, good engines. So, I think those things help too. All right, Dot of the Rings uh, <laughs> I like beard that. is uh, beating us up to let you go. So I'll get you out of here on this. What is success in 2015 for the ten car? I feel like. And the most specific answer I'll really give, because I, I don't know. I mean, I'm ready for anything. Like last year, I had never really run the whole race in, a, in the top 10, and, and that's what happened at Kansas. It didn't mean that I wasn't I, – I was ready for it, even though it hadn't happened before. So um, I'm ready for anything, but I think that if we can just kind of – be in the top 15 and, and, you know, each and every weekend and get very consistent at that, that would be good. We were doing that towards the end of last year, and um, – it uh, would be a good place to uh, to get to with this new crew chief, new crew, um, sooner than later. And then, you know, the ultimate goal is, of course, to win. I want to win, but um, you know, you can't uh, can't put the cart before the horse. I think that you set yourself up for disappointment, fa- failure, and judgment if you try and put that out there. Like that's that's. I mean, that is the ultimate goal, and that is the goal, and I'll be ready for it. But but uh, I think. Be in the top fifteen consistently will give us those opportunities when uh, when we uh, put it all together on a weekend. We wish you the best. Thank you so much for hanging Thanks, out Marty. with us, and uh, we'll see you at the beach. <laughs> okay, I'll see you at the beach. Thanks.
This is Larry Culpepper, inventor of the college football playoff. goes without saying that I know about a good idea or two when it comes to college football. And the best idea out there is to subscribe to the Championship Drive podcast in the Listen tab of your ESPN app. Well, that was uh, mighty nice of Danica to stop by. Dodd, how do you feel right now? I feel pretty good. I think I think you made a friend. I, I think, think you so made too. a I think that I think that she was so mesmerized with your facial hedge that I did you like that, honey? <laughs> facial hedge. I think that she will she'll never forget you, Dodd. You are forever ingrained in her mind. I think it's possible. She was really sweet, and uh, you could tell that the interview got off a little slow because she was having to digest all that was going on on this side, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, no, I don't. Why don't you explain? No, I, no, I know. You're good. No, we're just going. <laughs> we'll good. let the people figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Hey, but uh, listen, that was uh, – <laughs> but, the, but the question I asked <laughs> played to how she was acting to me because, to me, it's so much – she's different now than she was. Oh. I mean, listen, I covered her in IndyCar 10 years ago. Dude, it's not And everything was person. robotic. I mean, it was robotronic, man. It was Everything was calculated. And now there's a there's a, a comfort level that, you know. That's that's Ricky Stenhouse. That's there, yeah. You know, Ricky dragged her out to the dirt track and said, hey, I'm going to the dirt track. You're coming to the dirt track. Yeah. And she was like, I can't go to the dirt track. And he's like, you're coming to the dirt track. <laughs> you, me, and this mullet, we're going to the dirt track. And it's really been liberating, I think. It's really uh, opened her up a lot. And. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, she is funny and fun, and and I'm glad she stopped by. And I mean, of course, Dodd's glad she stopped by. Yeah. Now she's got to perform. Yep. We're, we're at that point now where, where it's year three, and uh, you know her teammate just won the championship. Had two teammates make the chase. You know, I, I think Tony Stewart was going to make the chase had he not had you know the the issues that he had to deal with you know second half of summer and, and in the fall. So it's time to go. I mean, it is, and she knows that. I, I've always contended, and have talked to her about this, that the timetable was was too quick. She needed another year in the Nationwide Series or X, Xfinity, whatever. That, she needed that, and and she knew that. I think she knew that, but it, ultimately that wasn't her call. People forget, and, man. This is her fifth year in a stock car. I know. Ever I know. like. I mean, I, and the, it, she's polarizing. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting to see the feedback from the fan base still. Oh, it'll, it'll, as soon as this thing posts. Oh, yeah. They'll be, oh, she doesn't deserve that car. We'll, we'll, I can't dude. believe you guys Bob. had her on the show. That's what I say. I feel naked. I don't have my guitar, but I do have this. I, I let him borrow my bell because uh, he didn't have his guitar. Where'd your dog toy? What? I mean, what Man, are you dude, doing we today? flew in here sideways. Just like Danica, we came, we, we flew into this deal sideways. I love Charlotte, but it calls itself a world class city. But the busiest, like our version of Peachtree Street Road in Atlanta, thoroughfare. Hey, eight forty five on a weekday, and we're trimming trees, baby. I mean, it's like you know, we're backing up traffic anyway. So, I, I am fascinated by her story, but I think that again. We're at the peak now of whatever it's going to be. It's either she's either on the rise now or on the backside. This this is the year. This is the third year, and this I is, agree a thousand percent. And look, it's not going to be easy. Brand no. new crew chief, who what she has three races under her belt. Right. No testing at her disposal. Right. Brand new rules package. Right. It's not going to be easy. No. And when you're out there running against twenty five guys that can win every weekend, it's hard. No. And uh, she's right. She did have a good run at Kansas. She had a uh, – was it Martinsville, too, or something? Yeah, Martinsville. In fact, she's, she's had a couple of good runs at Martinsville. Uh, she, so she's done well at Martinsville, always a threat at plate tracks. It's not beyond the realm of possibility that she could go to victory lane. It's just not. She could win Talladega. She sure. could win Daytona. And if she did, I think the time-space continuum would implode. Uh, it would be Bedlam in Bristol. We'd be on TV for the next week, yeah. straight week. Yeah, I mean, but well, it, I'm curious to see, and this is a question we'll ask her when we get down to Daytona, really after Daytona, because it's not a Daytona question. But you know, we got this thing in the ESPN magazine this week, kind of, kind of visually breaking down the rules. I didn't know what that noise was. What was that? That sounded like a goat. That was Laney moving was her microphone those, out of the way. One of those monsters from the Lord. Do of the that Rains. again, honey. Sorry, I was moving it out of my face. Do it again. Yeah, that kind of sounds like an old goat out there in the in the field. Probably at home they can't even hear it. That's Probably right. not. Carry so, on. But but I was just saying, I'm curious with the new rules package, 
and I've talked to Ricky Stenhouse about this, the cut and horsepower, the looser car, um, the sprint car guys are a little – they can't There's, decide how they feel about that because those guys, they're either sideways racers, so they're going to like the loose car, but they're also horsepower guys. And so that's why sometimes you see – now, Ricky Stenhouse, who is a sprint car guy – but he was successful in those nationwide, nationwide cars, car. which was low horsepower, and it's a momentum car. Flat through the corner well, is the thing. Right. I mean, there you, you don't spend, you don't lift. You spend two or three laps setting up a pass, as opposed to just just dropping the hammer, making a pass, which is really what what all that that's horsepower guy, did the last couple of years. That's another guy, by the way, who's in both of them. Who's in a very oh, yeah. important season. It's time for him to go too. Yep. I mean, he's got to go fast. Yep. And he knows it. Yep. And. Uh, you know, you're 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 a, a two-time champion in one series. You move your way up there, and he just has. They haven't gotten it done, man. He's got a new crew chief as well, Mike Kelly. His former crew chief goes to car chief, and my phone's ringing. And uh, it's an important year for Ricky too. And uh, Roush Fenway. Yeah, listen. For Roush Fenway. I mean, look, Greg Biffle needs to have a good year. T Bain makes his way up the cup now, and. Uh, that's a that's a team in transition trying to figure out its identity. Well, because they don't know what it is right now. Yeah, and they're in the process of, and it's going to take a little bit. But what it reminds you of, it reminds you of like a major league baseball team that's had a great run for a long time, and they look up one day and they realize everything they have is old. It's the Yankees. Everything they have, the, the players are old, and we've got to rebuild, and it's going to take a little time because you you can't just go grab free agents, which they've never done. They've never gone and gotten. You know they've lost drivers. They've never gone and gotten one, so they've got to build it from the inside. And now you're looking at a roster. Biffle's the oldest guy there. It, Carl Edwards obviously is gone. Matt Kenseth is gone. But now it's Trevor Bain in the six car. It's Ricky Stenhouse Jr. Both those guys, you know, have had their moments in the past, but it's been a while. Daryl Wallace Jr. Bubba's on the payroll now. So Elliot, they're they're in the process. Elliot Sadler, right? And but, the City but they're in the process. But I put Elliot Sadler Hold and Greg Biffle in that. In that in that group of these are the guys that we have for right now, but we know we're not going to have them very long because they're in the process of, of of tearing it down at the bottom and rebuilding from there. They're yeah. the Yankees, ironically owned by the Red Sox. Yeah, there you go. Oh. How about that? But the Red Sox too. The Red Sox, you know, they won their second World Series in '07 and looked around and went, okay, you know, we're old now. We got to go get some other guys, and that's it's it's and it's hard, but that's just how you have to do it. And, you know, back to Stuart Haas a minute. I expect, uh, looking at Tony Stewart during the media tour, he had a solace about him and a calm about him and a confidence that I haven't seen in a long time. And I think he is so ready to wash away from the last two years and start anew with a fresh conscience and and do his best. Uh, as we've said ad nauseum time and again on this on this podcast he'll never move past the kevin the kevin ward tragedy he won't but i think he is he does have the solace that the truth is out and he's ready to go race cars and be tony stewart again and i don't think for the you know broke his leg and then the the kevin ward scenario occurred and i don't think he was able to be tony stewart nope and I think he really, just aesthetically, just looking at him and feeling the vibe from him, I think he's finally ready to be Tony Stewart. We'll see. I, I'm curious to, once the season starts, I'm curious to get a good look at him when we get like to here in Charlotte in May because I cannot decide where his head is. And I think that he's at that age now. You know, we forget this because he started later, but, you know, he's the same age as the guys that we're talking about retiring now. And he's at that age where it happens to all professional athletes, where you go, okay, here we go. I'm going to pull up the bootstraps and just do it like I've always done it and do that All-American stuff. And sometimes it isn't there. And I'm curious to see in this season if he can find it again. He was I, fast. I don't have a he problem He was fast at the end of the year. Yeah. Uh, and that could be for myriad reasons. But – he was fast at the end of the year, yeah. so I see momentum uh, for him mentally. But you're right. I mean, who knows? Again, it's a whole different the, – the cars and the horsepower, and uh, there's a lot of differences to manage. And uh, they do have momentum as an organization with uh, with what Kevin and, and Rodney did. 
So who knows? I mean, it's uh, it's uh, going to be a wide open year with a lot of different storylines. I'm fascinated by him. He's almost exactly Jeff Gordon's age. They're both born the same year. They're born a little earlier in the year. I'm just saying. I just there's a there's a there's a, again he's at that he's at that that threshold. It's either going to go one way or the other. And does he have another great year or another handful of great years in him, or you know, does he go be a sprint car owner and yeah. a well, and that's the other thing too. Is a, I worry about the fact that I mean, he's not going to do the short track thing right now. He's not, and that's a big part of him that makes him feel normal. And when Joe Gibbs didn't let him do that for a while, that was he has said this. That was one of the toughest parts of his career because he didn't feel like himself. And eventually, he's just like well, I'm going to do it anyway. And so that part, big, you know, this a big part of the reason he went and did what he did was so that he could do whatever he wanted to do. And it's just, yeah, when that's, but I when think... that's not there, man. That's I always go back to. We did a home video with him when I was at NASCAR about ten years ago, twelve years ago. And I'm, and you know, and you know this. He and I have had plenty of screaming matches over the years. But there was a moment of him sitting in the stands, didn't know anybody could even see him, sitting in street clothes. On the top row at the Winchester Speedway, just watching a race, I've never seen a look like that on his face because it just it felt normal, and and that's what he's gonna have to try to find. Is he gonna have to try to find it without short track racing because he's not doing that right now? Yeah, he actually said during the media tour that he was it would be a long time yeah. before we yeah. saw him in one. I don't know, man. I feel like after coming out the other side of the Kevin Ward scenario, I have to think that he looks at looks at his own life very differently. Oh yeah. And looks at his priority scale very differently. Um yeah, that's it's part of his fabric. Sprint car racing is. But when you're when when you're staring at everything that he had to manage throughout that time, uh you know, the emotion of it, the uh whether, who was at fault, um and of course uh, the obvious uh, someone having died. Yeah. That's just so much more dynamic than anything else he's ever had to deal with in his life. And, this, and this coming on the heels awful. of the first time that he was felt mortal. Yeah. Which was the injury the year before, which you and I both know was a lot worse than a lot of people realize. And when it kept when it kept going on all the way through last spring, and he's still talking about yeah this surgery and it doesn't feel right, and people were like wow really yeah it was bad it was awful. You're the first one that told me people don't understand how bad this thing is. Yeah, he it it, it was really bad. And f- just as an update, there he actually told us a couple of weeks ago he has one more surgery scheduled. That's a a, a year from now or so. Yeah. Um, where they'll take out the titanium rod, I guess. Yeah, and uh, and he feel, he said he feels good. He's not walking with much of a limp. So, and guess what? He is now stepping into that Daryl Waltrip, Buddy Baker, Dell Earnhardt, Rusty Wallace role of when he gets to Speed Weeks, he's going to start becoming the story because he's never won the Daytona 500. Oh sure. And he, I mean, it really the comparison between I think that's been for years. Oh, to be but, but 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 it's but my point is it's going to get louder because. He's becoming Dale Earnhardt in that he's a multiple-time champion. You know, he's a legend. He's been down there now. It's not 20 times, but it's somewhere between 15 and 20. Hasn't won the race and has won every other race there is to win down there. I think this is year 18. Yeah. So the, so so he's right on schedule for you know for Daryl it was 17. What for Buddy it was 20. For Earnhardt it was what 17, 20. 18, it was 20. 20. Yeah. So it's so it's he's right in that wheelhouse now. And I remember Rusty Wallace. You know, the last couple of years he went out and he had a chance to win. Well, some of, one of Jeff Gordon's Daytona 500 wins last week, and Rusty's the one that had a chance to win that race and got picked. And Rusty's the one, I remember going in there for years, he go, oh, hell, here y'all come with the question. But that's just, that's what it is. It's the last thing left. It's the only thing left. Yeah. And, and he's going to get the question. And we'll see. But it's, uh, I, I, I'm, well, I'm fascinated to see where his head is and where his heart is. And, where we are with him when we get to typically he has that hot streak you know early in the season and then he has that hot streak in the middle of the summer and I'm curious to see what we have with him when we get to you just to wonder you just I, I, I'm I'm trying to look deeper at this you wonder what the impact is that he can just go race right he won't have a conscience he right. can go race the damn race car right none of the pending mess that he's dealt with the last two years is hanging over him he can go race a car 
And the, that's got to be liberating. Oh, yeah. And that has to be a feeling, that has to be a weight removed that is beyond description, that we you just can't quantify. He can be, he can go pinch people's butts, and he can go be the guy. I don't know. I think I think that's going to have a dramatic impact. I don't. I'm I don't, really curious to see. I, I, but my, me too. And, and then, but when you see with any professional athlete when they get to this point in their life and in their career, and they've had two major setbacks two years in a row, you wonder what the tipping point is going to be either way. Who's ever had a set? Who's ever had back to back setbacks like that? Uh, not that I can remember. Uh, me either. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 I mean, there's no comparison to the situation he had with, with Kevin Ward Jr. And then the injury that he had, obviously, on top of it. So I don't know. But that's the question is, where is your head? Because, where's your heart? Because the tipping point is going to come one way or the other. If he blows everybody's doors off at Daytona and wins the race, then you know, you know, Katie bar the door, there's no telling what he could do through the year. But as soon as there's any sort of setback, I just wonder how he's going to react to it now as a wounded mortal as opposed to smoke. Maybe it's a guy with a new lease on his life. Yeah. Maybe it's a guy. That's what I'm that that's where I'm trying to yeah. wrap my hands around his his mental spot right now because what he had to manage last oh. year yeah. is so awful and so so there's so much depth to it because forget racing. Right. This is the human element, yep. right? And he both said for that. both for Kevin Ward's family and for the sprint car community and certainly for Stewart, it was just terrible for everyone involved. And now he can start to go he can go be and there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah. Well, I ho- I hope what we see is that we see the him messing around with I Dana hope so Harvick too. and him joking. I, I, I want to. I want to see that because because guys, I think the moment we see that, we'll know. Okay, he's back. Until I, that's then, what, until and, then we'll see. And, and hopefully we will. And that's what I feel like I saw when he addressed us a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I felt like I saw a guy comfortable in his own skin and not apprehensive and just okay to smile. It's okay, okay to, to be. Yeah, just be. Yeah. And we'll see. You're right. I mean, it is going to be, it's going to be fun to see where he is. Yeah. And then the flip side of that is, I wrote a column yesterday about what you and I talked about, which is Jeff Gordon has the opportunity to, in a career built on unprecedentedness, is that a word? It is now. He has a chance to do one last thing that no one's ever done. And that's the walk off. And again, we don't pull for guys, but that would be cool. And it's that opportunity of it. And I made this comparison to Derek Jeter a year ago, and how by the end of Derek Jeter's victory lap, everybody was tired of it, and all the columnists were going, "Ugh, the dude's hitting 240, and he's got four home runs on the year. You know, he's killing the team long term, and they're sacrificing the the future for the present, and all this other stuff." And you think about all the great athletes, Willie Mays falling down in the outfield or Johnny United's playing for the Chargers. You know, you think about all the great athletes. Daryl Waltrip, I mean, one of the saddest things I've ever seen in my life was when Daryl was running what Travis Carter's car, that, that Kmart 60, Route 66 car, and him screaming in jubilation in the garage at the Coke 600 because he made, made the, the race. race. Yeah. Because he made the race, not because he won the race. Got won that race for anybody else, and but just seeing those things, there. Oh, my, my, I mean, Richard Petty not winning for almost what seven and a half years. It just, but Jeff Gordon has a chance to do something that never happens, particularly in racing, which is go out on top. You imagine what it felt like for Daryl. I actually talked about this uh, NASCAR, or I don't even know I, I, NASCAR media. NASCAR's media arm uh, interviewed me a couple weeks ago for this huge show they're doing on Dale Earnhardt, right, and we got to talk about Daryl and rivalries and how much he and Earnhardt loathed each other and how ugly it got and how Earnhardt put him in the fence of Richmond, damn near could have killed him. Right. And then you think, so what, 15, 20 years down the line, when Steve Park got hurt and Dale put DW in that one car and DW went fast. Yeah. 
You imagine what that was like for Daryl. Next time we have him on, we got to just have him take us through that. Well, when because we did, it must have been the most humbling yeah. thing for him. Well, when we did the Dale documentary, when I was with NASCAR, this is what, which was tremendous, by the way. That executive producer must have just been brilliant. Yeah, the writer was handsome. I know that. I mean, who? Gosh, who could have written? The writer was guy looked like Johnny Benson. <laughs> <laughs> but, then, but 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 we interviewed Daryl for that film, and he talked about that, and could barely talk about it without breaking down crying. Yep, because he was on the rocks, man. Oh, he, I know. He, he had gone bankrupt, owning his own team. When we went through the whole driver owner thing that broke Ricky Rudd, broke Bill Elliott, broke all of them, uh, and then he was running up front, and it was and it was that last moment of reminding everybody, okay, I can still I do can this. I can still wheel it, right. And and he needed that because it was it was it was the last little exclamation point on what had been just I mean almost a decade of just irrelevance and so that's what everybody wants everybody wants that last great moment of this is what it is and that's what's so the potential for Jeff Gordon to if he even has half the year he had a year ago he still goes out better than than ninety nine percent of them I can't think of a racer. That went out like that. I mean, all of them, AJ Foyt, all of them, all those guys. Usually, usually it ends in an ambulance. And you know, Richard Petty's case, it ends on fire. You know, in yep. what in turn two at Atlanta or turn one Atlanta. It's just, it's a chance for Jeff Gordon to, even if he doesn't win a championship, you know, to make a lot of noise and win some races and just go out on top, which which would be the fitting end of the career. I think that you and you and I need to do a thirty for thirty movie. On the 1992 season finale. I agree with that. Jeff's la- uh, first race, King's last race. Yep. Uh, Gre- tremendous greatest, points, greatest points battle, battle. Yep. between Davey, Allison, Ernie Irvin, and Bill Elliott. And Kawiki. The, and Kawiki and the strategy that Allen used. And then uh, six months later, Allen and Davey are gone. Gone. Um, I think we could. I think we could do one BA movie. All right. I'm gonna. I'm gonna send this. I'm gonna send a link to this podcast to all those people. I bet they'll care. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. You got. You got to go to Daytona, son. I got to go to Daytona. It's time to ride, baby. Well, I'll be uh, be doing media day, and then we have uh, the Sprint Unlimited, which basically means an unlimited amount of cars. Yeah, my understanding... Five people pulled out of the thing, right? Yeah, my understanding that Pete Hamilton, winner of the 1970 Daytona 500, he's in. <laughs> Derek Coke's anybody, coming back. Yeah, Derek, any, anybody that ever did anything, you, you get to... If you ever, you ever started a race at Daytona, you're in. So... Dave Marcus in the real tree Chevy. There you go. STG Wiper Blades. Oh. Is that it? Oh. Prodigy. There you go. Dave Marcus in the number 71 Prodigy.net. Was it the Chevy. 2000 Daytona 500 when Johnny Benson... Was running that Lycos Pontiac yeah. and was leading with like five oh, to yeah. go. I was and fired up. Who, did Dale Jarrett win that race? Yes. He won a 2000 yeah. Daytona 500. Yeah. I remember that race because we were in old Benny Con Media Center. Oh man. And old Johnny Benson was in the lead in that. Was it white or black? It was it, white. It was black. It was the only because he got that sponsorship late, right? Right. Was that the was that the year that Lycos was on the car, but then. Like they right before the race, they started yanking the decals off. They pulled off the it all. Yeah, yeah, it was oh, something yeah. crazy. Oh, yeah. it, I it forget. Was, it was. It, listen, this is the it, kind of thing where Laney, get your microphone over here. When baby. the internet boom happened, that was one of the wildest. There would be guys putting these websites on their cars. There was a guy that had a truck. What a, about? And he'd be cutting Kevin decals LePage. in the garage. I know. Kevin LePage had like the home dot com for oh, yeah, that yeah. pink or um, it was a purple and white number sixteen car. Right? How about uh, at Hendrick? Even Hendrick Motorsports fell for the thing. Remember that? Remember the uh, what day? What gosh, it? it was Jerry Nadeau. Oh, MichaelHolligan.com Chevrolet. Go. What? I tell you what, did that car go to Victory Lane in Atlanta, or did the UAW GM that was UAW Chevrolet GM, go to Victory? Was, I think it started as Holligan. This oh, is yeah. the kind of thing where Laney. I can't remember. Sauce. I can't remember to 
take our like I, I, I know. For, no, I, no 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 my wife says I, I forgot says our daughter yeah Erica says I forgot I had to pick up our daughter at preschool for like 30 minutes yeah. she was th- the the, the oh, yeah. teacher calls home and says hey are you gonna come pick up your kid or drop her off yeah Once or I drop her off home from carpool and you, she was in her pajamas still right yeah but I can remember the Lycos Pontiac that led with five to go in the 2000 Daytona 500 yeah. you forgot huh? you forgot to mail in the house payment but you know who the right who the rear tire changer was for Steve Park in the Bush series. Do you I'm, know I'm, I'm, like, met, I'm like Joey Knuckles. I met Michael Holligan. <laughs> oh, yeah. Michael Holligan was at Hendrick Motorsports when they did. Okay, so I think they did the announcement. You just and missed then, a Joey Knuckles reference, by the way. No, I got it. Okay, I, I, I filed it away. I'll make sure you saw it. And that. then I think they went to Jerry Nadu's house yeah. and were putting like new gutters on his house or something crazy. Yeah. You ever on, hear about Lake you, Norman. You know my Nadu story? No. All right, so I was living when I first moved to Charlotte to work on RPM tonight. Huh. And I had a fossil. I had a Terry Labonte Woosaw. I, I had a Terry Labonte cornflakes like cutout thing. Like they had at the grocery store. Like a cardboard you know, stand up. Him, him a cardboard stand up, him standing there holding a box of cornflakes with his cow with his, and Kellogg his mustache. Uniform. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. I had one of those and I had it standing in my den in my for some reason in my in my apartment, right? And I found this woman's I found this girl's uh, um, driver's license out in the parking lot of the apartment complex, and she was she was good looking. And I'm single, and I'm like, hey, so I call information, huh. and I find her number, and I call her. Is that a little bit stalkery? No, no, no. I, but listen, it's her driver's license, right? Is stalkery. I call, hey, I found your driver's license in the parking lot, and so you were being chivalrous. So she says, well, where do you live? And I give her, well, hey, she goes, I live right downstairs. I'll come upstairs and get the thing. I said, okay, great. So she comes upstairs and opens the door, and I go, hey, here's your license. She's like, I mean, she's really good looking. And she goes, hey, what's that in the back back there? I said, that's Terry Labonte. <laughs> and she goes, are you a NASCAR fan? I go, I am. I go, in fact, I work. You know, I work for a TV show, and all that. I'm thinking I'm trying to impress her, right? And I'm Because I'm thinking, I, mean, I got an in here. And she goes, hey, my boyfriend drives race cars. Uh, he should come talk to you. Maybe you, he can, you can have him on the show sometime. He's over in Europe racing Formula Opal cars. And I'm like, okay. Whatever. She goes, yeah, his name's Jerry Nadu. I go, okay, sure. I don't know who the guy is. Two days later, knock, knock, knock. There's Jerry Nadu. Hey, hey Ryan. Man, I heard you work on RPM tonight. I want to be on the show. And we had him on the show. I didn't get a date with her. No. Well, once again, lost think, out to a race car driver. I think he probably put a ring on it. Yeah. So, yeah, it was there you go. So, Terry Labonte, I thought was going to get me a date, and all he did was he got me an interview. Come on, with, Texas. With Jerry Nadu. <laughs> Come on, man. It's going to be weird going to Daytona and Terry's not there. The last couple of years, when he was just kind of making the field, I'd always walk down to the, end yeah. of the grid and I go, "Dude, what are you doing?" He's like, "I'll be leading at halfway." Last year, I pulled that money <laughs> up, and sure enough, but at the halfway point, we're like, he was running like third. He's like, "It's a hundred grand, man." I said, "Yeah." You know what's crazy? All right, we got to be done with this. Yeah, we like do. you think about last year's Daytona 500, Swan Racing. Yeah. Right. Gone. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Parker Kligerman and Cole Witt. Yeah. Nope. Crazy. How about Jeb Burton? How about Jeff Burton? Going to be in the field. I love that guy. He's great. Dude. That's a good kid right there. He's great. When he ran a truck race, they ran a truck race, or the first truck race back at Rockingham, which that's a whole other show we can do about Rockingham. What a mess. But right, like the, the first truck race back, track's been dark for years, and we're all standing out on the front stretch, and they do the national anthem, and the crowd goes crazy, and the parachuters are coming all stuff. I said, Hey! I look over there and Ward is standing right there by by Jeb's truck and he goes, This felt like damn nineteen ninety seven all over again, don't it? <laughs> and being a Pontiac. I said, Yes it does, Ward. I guess we gotta go, don't you? You got yeah. a plane to catch. We gotta go. Really quickly before we do that, I got a thing I gotta wrap up here. Uh, unprecedentedness, yeah. robotronics, and stalkery, none of them are words. And you used all three of them. They're yeah, words. The if you, you hit know the what bell, it becomes a word. Here's what I think, Lord of the Dodds. <laughs> I think that we it's our show, and if we want it to be a word, by grannies, it's a word. The deal right. is if you say it and you hit the bell, it becomes a word. It becomes a word. That's how it works? Yeah, it's like, uh, like what's, what's the Christmas movie? Dot of the Rings. About every time a bell rings, a, a word gets in the dictionary. You know, I think I figured out why Danik and I hit it off so well today. Is because everyone always called you know her by the wrong name, even though it was pretty obvious. What did she say, Denisha? Den- <laughs> there, were all, there were a number Dancia. of them. Dancia. Dancia. Yeah, yeah, Dancia. Dancia. You know, and you I think I saw Dancia down at the Xanadu in Myrtle Beach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't 
don't have my strings. I can't. I feel I naked. So what were you saying? So what were you I was saying, just going to say, you two jamokes called me the wrong name for a, a while. <laughs> I still do. I still do. Right. Every day. So, you know, we've got this connection that I think that's why it worked so well on the side. Hey, by the way, say that word again, what we are. What we are. Jamokes. My name is Dot. I have a facial hedge that Dan Sia thinks is cute. I look like Julian Edelman, and I don't even wear a suit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we got to go, don't we?